I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. I am Naya Swami Maria, and this is Naya Swami Ananta. And a special welcome to those of you who are here for the first time, whether it's through the expanding light or visiting friends or family. Yogananda would oftentimes say, I want to give you all an experience of him. And I hope that whether you are watching this online or here for the weekend, just for an occasion, that through these sacred surroundings, through these universal teachings, you have such a blessing. I'm going to begin with a reading from Rays of the One Light. And these are based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda with commentary by Nayaswami Kriyananda. And this week, oh, I've got such beautiful light out here, I, <laughs> I'm going to be all right. So this week, the service is entitled The Redeeming Light. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. The book of Isaiah in the Bible, chapter 9, tells us, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of shadow of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. What is this light of which so many scriptures speak? An autobiography of a yogi by Paramhansa Yogananda we read of an early experience the Master had with that light. I was blessed about the age of eight with a wonderful healing through the photograph of Lahiri Mahashai. This experience gave intensification to my divine love. While at our family estate in Ikapur, Bengal, I was stricken with Asiatic cholera. My life was despaired of. The doctors could do nothing. At my bedside, mother frantically motioned me to look at Lahiri Mahashaya's picture on the wall above my head. Bow to him mentally. She knew I was too feeble even to lift my hands in salutation. If you really show your devotion and inwardly kneel before him, your life will be spared. I gazed at his photograph and saw there a blinding light enveloping my body and the entire room. My nausea and other uncontrollable symptoms disappeared. I was well. At once I felt strong enough to bend my head, to bend over my over and touch mother's feet in appreciation of her immeasurable faith in her guru. Mother pressed her head repeatedly against the little picture. O oh, omnipresent Master, I thank thee that thy light hath healed my son. I realized that she too had witnessed the luminous blaze through which I had instantly recovered from a usually fatal disease. Where my light is, God once told a saint whom the divine light had healed, no darkness can dwell. The divine light, pure, calm, liberating, is the only final cure for every kind of delusion, ill health, emotional grief, and spiritual ignorance. Seek it daily in the silence, in deep meditation. As the Bhagavad Gita says in the fifth chapter, for whom that darkness of the soul is chased by light, splendid and clear shines manifest the truth, as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed 
its beams of light. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. I'd like to read from Whispers from Eternity. Demand to see God in everything. O Father, may I behold thee above, beneath, behind, around, wherever I turn my gaze. Train the children of my senses never to stray from thee, who dwellest at the heart of everything. Turn my eyes inward to thy changeless beauty. Attune my ears to silence, that I may hear thy subtlest music. Breathe on me the heavenly scent of thy sacred presence. Orient-wise, I will worship thee, placing in the candles of my five senses on the altar of my love. Thus I will contact thee in the first pale shafts of dawn, absorb thee in the bright light of noon, Expand in thee with the hidden glow of twilight and merge in thee in the silver moonlight. Always will I keep a light on the, my inner altar, the mystic taper of my love for thee. I'd like to again welcome you all. The topic of talking about the redeeming light is always good. Uh, we always start with the fire ceremony and we end with the Festival of Light, and in between we basically talk about light in some form. And I'd like to um, address a few um, aspects of this subject. It's vital for our spiritual life. It's the center of our spiritual life. In this reading, Paramahansa Yogananda is dying of Asiatic cholera at the age of eight. So it's 1901 in Bengal. And his mother says, if you bow to Lahiri's picture, if you bow to her guru, then you'll be healed. Now, Master already is a guru, so we'll just drop that for now and go right into the story. But Lahiri Morshai is a representation of the light. He's a being who is totally identified with the light. He's omnipresent. By this time, he's left the body, 1901. But by simply bowing to Lahiri, and his mother said, you've got, to, you've got to call on the light. By calling on the light, Master drew that healing light. And it is because this universe is made of light, that the divine decided to separate itself. Master says he separated themselves into the Maya. And so by an act of will, God manifests the world that we are involved in, which is light and darkness. By that will of the divine, we exist seemingly separate from the divine. But in reality, we are not separate from the divine. And all that is needed on our part is an act of will to reunite ourselves with that light. Yogananda called on that light. He bowed mentally to that light. The light healed him. He lived happily ever after. I just think if he died at Asiatic cholera at the age of eight, where would we be? I don't know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be quite the same. So we need to be aware, first of all, that this universe is composed of light, not of darkness. That light is the essence of reality, the divine light. That the duality that we endure on a daily basis is the sense of separation. That I'm different from you, you're different from your neighbor, you're different from your co-workers, that we're different beings, and that we're striving to contact God, the search for God. 
But the reality of it is, is it's God searching for God. We're part of God. And light is the only dimension of reality in this universe. Everything else is divided. Maya is the measurer. Maya is what we're enduring. And so we have different colors. We have different places and dimensions and space and time and all these divisions to one abiding universal reality. And so in a sense, it's a cosmic joke that we think ourselves separate from God. We think ourselves needing to find God, needing to go travel the spiritual path. Where do we travel to? We don't travel anywhere. But we merely wake up to a, an abiding reality. And that's the purpose of our lives, is to wake up to that joy. When you use binoculars or a microscope or a telescope, you have to focus your field of vision. If you have a telescope, my wife is a bird expert. And she finds these strange birds and she takes the binoculars and she focuses on them. But if you focus on one point, a close point, and get the binoculars perfect, you'll see the bird clearly. But if you turn that binocular up to those trees or to the back row, everything will be fuzzy. The clarity comes from the object of focus in perfecting that clarity. What we need to do as truth seekers is to focus on light and to absorb ourselves in that range. There is a huge range of experience available to us at all times. We can focus on darkness. We can focus on violence. We can focus on money. We can focus on material things. We can focus on more lofty things. We can focus on harmony, music, beauty, art, nature. And we can focus on even higher realms. Divinity, Sri Teshwar, Lahiri Moshai, Babaji, the Buddha, Krishna. The spectrum of visibility, if you will, the spectrum of consciousness is quite broad. And we have to make a decision on a day-by-day -day basis what area of that spectrum do we want to focus on. The masters recommend highly that you focus on the light, on the redeeming light. That you focus on the light because the light is the only real component in this universe. Everything else is a shadow show. It's an illusion. It seems very real that you're separate than I am. But the reality of it is that we are a part of all that is. The reality of it is, is there's one light and it's animating everything. So the formal practice of focus on an aspect of the light, on divinity, is called meditation. Meditation is concentration on some aspect of the infinite. It's for a period of time shutting out the perception of the senses, smell, taste, touch. It's shutting out the consciousness of the elements of your being, your net worth, your stock market holdings, your personality, your likes and dislikes. And for a little bit of time, let all of that go and not focus on it. And focus on an abiding reality that is this light. Disconnect as deeply as you can from the other duality and focus entirely on the light. That's meditation. There's many paths to meditation, many schools of meditation. But if you go into them deeply, you'll find that they all offer us an opportunity to shut out the spectrum of experience for everything but the pure light of God. If you don't want to use the word God, don't use the word God. Use the word light. Use the word joy. Use the word bodhisattva nature. Use any name you want. The name is not the experience. The experience is that reality. But the experience of absorption in that reality is the spiritual experience. The masters live in that consciousness all the time. 
having disconnected from the senses, from likes and dislikes, they are absorbed in that light. One day after a long meditation, Paramahansa Yogananda came out in, with a group of the disciples and he said, you have no idea how beautiful you are. Silver light and golden light, that's all you are, that's all I see. Now, Paramahansa Yogananda was a master and so he could perceive that light beyond the form of those people. Those people probably looked like us. They were various races and ages and they had various clothes on and it wasn't that he didn't see that. It's that he was focusing on an abiding reality that exists through that and behind that. And the fact is that we are all, every one of us, children of one father, God. We are children of one mother, the divine mother. We are literally brothers and sisters and part of one spiritual family. We are rays of one light. That's a fact. But we have to focus on that. Because if we don't focus on that, the maya is very, very powerful. And it will pull us into innumerable dead ends in life. And we will be caught a time and time again by materialism, by sensory awareness, by harmful emotions. And so the spiritual path is a recipe, if you will, for aligning yourself, body, mind, and soul, with that light. And every spiritual path has different approaches to it, but if you really get underneath them, you find that they try to give us non-attachment, as the affirmation said, and a way to absorb ourselves in that light. So first of all, we need to take up the daily practice of meditation and hold on our consciousness on that light. Use the techniques that any guru will give you. If it's Yogananda's path, it's Hongsa and energization and Om and Kriya. And the teachings of Raja Yoga, Patanjali's teachings. Because we absorb ourselves in that light. And the deeper the meditation, the more absorbed you are in that light. The more that when you leave meditation, you may be able to carry the awareness of that light's reality through your day. And that is good. That's what Yogananda was doing. He could see that everyone was a being of light. They weren't especially good people. I mean, they were good people, but they were no better than you. If I had master state, I would say, I just see beings of silver light and golden light in all of you. And I can say that. I can say that we see in the world around us with practice the reality of that light emanating more and more. At first you see it easily in prayer and in beauty, in beautiful clothes. You all look very nice today. Everyone wears their best Sunday best to, to service. They're clean and neat. Uh, we see it in nature. We see it in these beautiful clouds. We see it in the sky. We see it in our work. But eventually, as you keep focusing on that light, if you meditate every morning and every night and a little bit at noon and whenever you can, and if you keep your consciousness in on the focus of that light, a change comes into your perception and you begin to perceive things more like the masters. You begin to perceive that there's light everywhere. The light is omnipresent, by the way. That's one of the qualities of it. Therefore, whatever we're looking at, whatever we're doing, there's light there. But it takes a refinement of our perception to keep that consciousness. Because the maya, the delusion, is very strong sometimes. Don't think that in the life that Paramahansa Yogananda lived from 1893 till 1952, that the world was full of light and joy. The world was the world. He lived through two world wars. He lived through the Holocaust. He lived through racism and all the terrible ills of mankind between those years. Many of those are still going. We have wars all over the planet right now. But you're, you came here this morning because you wanted to focus on the light. Or 
your boyfriend or girlfriend drag you to the service, one or the other. <laughs> but anyway, you got here. That's the main thing. <laughs> and you're seeking, we're all seeking that perception of that light and that experience of that light and that reality that that light is the abiding reality. And the more you practice, the more that you perceive that light everywhere. We see in Swami Kriyananda, a longtime disciple of Yogananda, a person who has practiced Kriya Yoga for 65 years now, that his perception of reality is increasingly of that light. And that the Maya isn't able to distract his consciousness from harmony, from beauty. Bit by bit, we see him absorbed day by day, minute by minute, in a blissful reality. And he describes it to us, the fact that his body is slowly decaying, it doesn't matter. The bliss is important. The fact that life is as usual, sometimes joyful, sometimes troubled, doesn't matter. Because that's not the reality. Sometimes there's clouds, and sometimes there's sunrise, sunshine, and sometimes there's sweet music, and sometimes there's horrible music. But beyond that, behind that, as we practice, we begin to perceive that the light is animating everything. Even in bad circumstances. <laughs> Master used to say, people are so skillful in their ignorance. And I, I love that because we are. We are so skillful in our ignorance. We are able to convince ourselves that this is a good idea. It's a horrible idea spiritually. It's a terrible thing. And we convince ourselves, yeah, uh, this is really, and we go further. We say, this is what God wants me to do. <laughs> We're totally out of tune with the reality. But... <laughs> We're trying. And the light is trying to manifest. People are trying to attune themselves to fulfillment and happiness. Some people think that they'll do that through worldly pursuits, through drugs and alcohol and gambling and all sorts of terrible things, terrible spiritually from our point of view, but not terrible spiritually from their point of view. Because they're aspirants. We're all true seekers, really. And it's just a question of how much suffering we need to endure to force ourselves to seek the light. Count yourself as lucky. Count yourself that you're very lucky that you've gotten to this point and that you are ready to seek that light and to perceive it. Master said the spiritual path is difficult at first and then effortlessly liberating. Why is that? Because the more you look for the light and the more you experience the light, the more it becomes native to you, the more it feels right. It's very easy for a saint to do the right thing. They don't have another idea. They don't have thwarting cross currents of ego. And so they just follow the light. And Master did everything just by guidance of the light. He cooked his food by tasting it at the spiritual eye. Instead, he didn't even have to taste it. I mean, is that great or what? You know, in everything that you do, try to see that light and try to see behind whatever it is that you do for a living or that you take care of kids or if you're a school teacher or auto mechanic or a, whatever it is, try to see that light as behind everything and everyone and see people not as a person you don't like or a sinner or this or that, but see them as a being of light moving towards self-realization bit by bit, step by step, and enjoy the show. Enjoy the varied positions that we're all in as we try to move towards the light. But keep your focus especially on that realm of consciousness that is purity and beauty and kindness. And you will see that you see people more and more in their own most beautiful aspect. People actually appear more beautiful to you. Colors appear more dynamic to you because the reality of it is, is that the light is the only real part of this universe and everything else fades away. Master would see that light and live in that light. And Rajasi and Sister Gyanamata and all the disciples 
And I can say for all of us that practice yoga, you can just take increments of year by year, decade by decade, lifetime by lifetime, and you see more light. You perceive more light. You're comfortable with the light. You're uncomfortable with the darkness. You're uncomfortable with separation. You're uncomfortable with those aspects. And you are able to relax with the situation as it is. Master wasn't terribly aggravated that the world was at war. Of course, he was sad. It's terrible. But he could see behind even terrible suffering that that is how the light changes consciousness. That is because of the atrocities that occurred in the Second World War, the Geneva Convention and various agreements among nations were agreed upon. We cannot do this anymore. This can never be acceptable. We must never have genocide. We must never have this and that and war crimes and all these horrible things that we don't like to think about, but which happened. But from that comes the light. The masters see the end result of all this. They see beauty and kindness and harmony emerging from terrible situations. So they're unaffected to a certain extent. I don't mean to say that they're insensitive. And I don't mean to say that they're not caring. But what I'm saying is that when you live in the ultimate reality of the light, you remember that the shadows pass. But the light does not pass. The light exists in the end. And we all merge with the Father Mother, God. There's an interesting tape of Paramahansa Yogananda. He's talking about being at Forgarpar Road in his meditation room. And he has a vision. And in the vision, he's a soldier. And he's shot on the battlefield. And Master's confused. He says, wait a minute. Am I at Forgarpar Road in Calcutta? Or am I shot? How can I be shot? I'm beyond death. I can stop the breath. How can I be shot? And so what does he do? He asks God for an explanation. He says, Father? No, he says, Sire? Light? Am I on the battlefield? He asks God as Sire, Father, an ancient English term for Father, and Light. Where am I? Commune with that light. Talk to that light. As he, Master, did, bowing just mentally to that picture of Lahiri Moashai. A very valid prayer is, Reveal thyself. Just ask that light to continue to reveal itself. And it will. It will reveal itself because you're aspiring. You're its child. You're asking. Every mother will answer its child's question. Mommy, I need this. Okay, you know, I'll come and help you. Father, help me. He'll come. Because he's with you all the time. You are a part of all that is. You are made of light. You are a being of light. Live in that and you will see it more and more. You will see every human being, and I mean that, every human being as an incarnation of God. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful change from the duality. I don't like this. How could he do that? How could she do that? A vibration of love unites us with the brothers and sisters that are also in that light. That is the aspiration. And then, when we have that, the masters are even more treasured because we see in them perfect reflections. Guru is the dispeller of darkness. And you are a guru. You are the dispeller of darkness. You are a being of infinite love and kindness. Concentrate on that. Realize that. God bless you.
I was caught up in ecstasy. T'was a day sanctified by God. There he showed me the truths of heaven, truths which all seeking him should know. How the soul made to live in freedom can reclaim its eternal right. How the night born of our delusion can be fired blazing with his light.